My name is Rabia. Uh, I hold a master's degree in human resources management and training from the University of Leicester. I'm a CIPD level seven associate who has worked in learning and development since 2001 and moved around the region. But mostly and most importantly for me, I'm a learning adult since 2001. This is how I would like to position myself and to inspire people that I need to keep on developing this. So that's quickly the introduction. Regarding the dynamics, since it's only a 45 minute thing, I'd like to go with um, a presentation first about the topic itself. And by the end, I will allow for your questions and answers. However, I would really encourage you to type in your question in chat wherever it comes to your mind. First, to just record it and uh, keep it for answering it later on. But mainly, if I feel like I could address it right away, I will do uh, the best to, to address your questions as soon as possible. So thank you so much again. Uh, I just need to make sure that your mic so far unmuted. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. And let's go through. So definition of HR analytics is the first thing I would like to address. Before the scientific definition of HR analytics, I would like to tell you that these kind of tools that we're going to introduce are not new. Mainly, they are statistics, a branch of mathematics that studies trends, probabilities, uh, data more in generally, and would allow us to diagnose problems, would allow us to predict any kind of incidents or activities that will happen in the future and would also give us the chance to find out some solutions. Some of them would be prevented to avoid some of the problems that we might face. So to give you an idea of how all this kind of science is, I'm sure that any time you go to for a mortgage or for a loan, the bank would ask you to provide lots of details about yourself and lots of documents as well and evidence. And mainly, mainly the question that the bank wants an answer about is whether Rabia is going to pay the monthly installment regularly or not. In the banking language, they call it, are you going to default your loan? Or this means, are you going to miss on the payment or face difficulties in paying that? And as you see, this question is futuristic. It's asking, is Rabia going to default his installment? So actually, the bank is predicting whether you are going to have enough money to settle the bill. How could they know? Now, when you go to a doctor and they ask you a question, do you smoke or you don't? Somebody in your family has cholesterol, uh, how's how does the pain look like? Does it move through your body? Does it come and go? Have you been traveling lately, etc.? All these are diagnosis questions. But for that, they will be able to tell out of thousands of diseases that exist nowadays, which one is yours. And they will be able accordingly to prescribe the right medicine. Moreover, definitely, you know, in social media, there's a very famous predictive model that Netflix utilized to recommend 
movies, documentaries, series for a certain user based on their preferences. And it's all based on the history and their profile and the way it compares with the current similar users that they have on the platform. What I'm trying to tell you is utilizing data to diagnose problems, to predict incidents or future events and prescribe problems is not something new. However, unfortunately, it's fairly new to human resources professionals. And that's why I would like to take you through a quick journey on the steps of addressing an HR problem using data analysis, which we will call, for short, HR analysis. And these steps might seem sometimes straightforward, might seem sometimes utilizing terminology that we are not really familiar with. And if you have a chance to read the description of the webinar itself throughout your registration process, I clearly mentioned that we cannot anymore as HR community to say we are not good with numbers. That's not an option anymore. It's a short-term option for some of us, but it's not going to be an option for any of us in the near future. So that's why we need to be good with numbers. We need to become good with numbers because when you are good with numbers, they will make you look good in front of management, in front of stakeholders, and in front of your team altogether. So the way I would like to address the process of HR analytics is through six steps mainly. And I'm going to detail each and every one throughout this webinar. And I said before, please feel free to type in your question at any point of time, and I will be more than happy to address it if possible. So the first step of an analytics project could be proposing a hypothesis. And thinking about the hypothesis as a technical term or a very uncommon terminology, I would like to replace maybe hypothesis with an assumption or with a theory that you come up with, with a conclusion that comes to your mind from observing a set of events for a while. Like husband who come up with findings and theories and uh, conspiracies, if I might I say, or assumptions about women just because they married one or two. Uh, like when you look at one or two or three Toyota cars down the road and then you come up with a statement which is very firm and you say, Toyota sale is increasing in 2024. So hypotheses are statements that look like factual, but in fact they are not until truth. And the whole idea of research is proving hypotheses. And this is what we are adopting in each other. Step number two would be once we propose a solid, interesting, scientific mm -hmm. hypothesis, which usually comes maybe in the shape of a question, we would need to identify the variables that this hypothesis encompasses. And by variables, I mean, what are the main features that we are trying to relate together? The older you get, the less interest you have in going out. That's a hypothesis. So, as you can see, there are variables. The older you get is telling us about your age. And the less you'd like to go out is telling us about the number of times that you go out a month. 
So these are variables that we are trying to measure in order to validate our response. Step number three would be collecting data. Sometimes cleaning this data, sometimes converting this data into numbers. Because if the data remains as words or as statements or as a like scale range of five options from agreeing to disagree, that will not allow us to utilize a software that analyzes data and generates some findings accordingly. So once we collect the data and we convert it to the numeric value, then we will be able to utilize statistical tests that will validate or reject the hypothesis itself that we have proposed in step number one. And this is mainly the most technical part of the HRML. While in step number five, step number six, what we will need to do is to be able to communicate the findings that we extracted from the first four steps and then out of uh, prescription, be able to offer solutions and recommendations for the organization according to the studies that we have uh, done and the analysis that we have. So far, so good. Everyone can hear me well. Just a quick check before we move forward. All right, no news, good news. So let's dig into the first step. Proposing a hypothesis. So as I mentioned before, a hypothesis is simply a very interesting theory that awaits confirmation. That's the main point of it. So having said that, I'd like to remind you about a very famous story of a well-known scientist called Isaac Newton. When he was sitting under an apple tree and an apple fell on his head, and all of a sudden, he said, there might be a force attracting everything towards the center of the earth. Now, that's what we call a hypothesis. And then when you prove this hypothesis, and if you can prove it for, like in a universal kind of shape, it becomes a law. And that's why we contribute to Isaac Newton the discovery of the laws of dynamics for every action, the reaction, etc., and all of that. So as you can see, while we wander around doing our day-to-day -day job, we come up with interesting theories. But if we could confirm those theories, then they would become solid laws that based on which we can understand problems and we can resolve problems. So I have here from the few four different hypotheses that might seem plausible, all right? And just for the sake of the interaction, if I uh, just give them numbers one, two, three and four. I'll read them aloud and I ask you on chat to type which one you truly believe that it's true. Which one? That, but just choose one. So my first hypothesis says as employees age, they tend to attend less training programs. The second says our recruitment process is biased toward candidates with fluent English. The third hypothesis claims that employees trained on safety will have less accidents on the job. And the fourth hypothesis suggests that customer, uh, customer service representatives with high emotional intelligence will get higher score from client feedback. So just Give me quickly your opinion, which one seems to be 
clear for you. Like it's yes, it's obvious. I agree. That's totally correct. I don't even have to prove it. All right. So let me ask you now, since most of you have chosen three, between one, two, and four, which would be interesting for you to explore and tell whether it is correct or not? All right, so just I, I'd like what I just wanted to, uh, yeah, in fact, all of them should be analyzed with data just to ensure that uh, they are properly uh, concluded because these are only assumptions, as I said before, and we can only confirm them through data analysis. Great, so. That's step number one. And as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, every one of us comes up with lots of hypotheses on daily basis from all of uh, as or aspects of life altogether. But those of them who are interested, interesting enough, and that if confirmed or non validated, would solve a problem or will uncover a reality. These are the ones that should undergo an analytics uh, study. So step number two, as I mentioned before, is identifying the types of variables included in the hypothesis itself. And in statistics, we offer several kinds of variables. Maybe one of it that you are very familiar with is a binary variable, which takes only two uh, input, like man or woman, like cold or hot, like uh, stay or resign, like attended or didn't attend, etc. All those kinds of examples are called binary variables. While another kind would be like something that you're very familiar with, but maybe you never had the chance to know the name, like continuous variables. The continuous variables are numerical values, are variables that can take an infinite number of numerical values between two, uh, two numbers, like, for example, the temperature. Like it could be 37.12356008, etc. Uh, height could be also a continuous uh, quantitative variable, and so on. So in step number two, what I'm just trying to do is to take one of the hypotheses that I shared before, and then I'd like to uh, identify the variables involved. So employees, employees trained on safety will have less accidents on the job. It's suggesting, in fact, two variables. One of them is whether an employee is trained or not. And the other one is the number of accidents that happen to an employee. So you could think of the variables as the two labels, like here, because we have two, as the column labels of your data file. Once you are trying to collect the data, the variables would be the titles of the columns. It's like just when you are collecting this data using Excel, this is how it's going to happen, but this is where you identify the variable. And that step is very important because depending on the type of the variable, we will be able to undergo some statistical tests while not the others. So it's very important to figure out from the beginning the choice of the body. Excuse me. So that's step number two. Moving to step number three. Step number three is about the collection and the conversion of the data itself. So whenever you come up with a hypothesis like the 
number four that we had customer service representative with high emotional intelligence will get higher support of client so as you can see it's as if i am going to have an excel file with two columns where the first column shows the scores on emotional intelligence of all my customer service representatives. The first one scored 97.2 out of 100. The second one scored 81.7 out of 100, etc. And for each of those, I would also require to collect the data of the feedback they have from the client. So in order to collect this kind of data, what do I need to do practically? Every customer service representative will have to take what we call an emotional intelligence selling aspect to measure their EQ. While from the other end, I would like also to collect the feedback that comes from the clients on each customer service representative. So Rabia as an might serve 100 clients in the month of January. And I would like to aggregate all those into an average score. So in this third step, after the step number two, which was identifying the variables, which in this case, just for the sake of another example, would be the score on emotional intelligence for each employee from one end and from the other end in the score of the client feedback, which comes as a, a continuous variable between one and five, something like that. So later on, I'd like to collect this data and make sure that the way I collect the data is validated. Sometimes you come up with surveys, but surveys cannot be just utilized. There's a process of testing the consistency of surveys that would make sure that it is working property and is helping the user to answer the question in a consistent manner. So all of that is part of the HR analytics program. And I would like to highlight here that nowadays, even if you've been working on an HR database for a while, most probably, most probably, you do not now on your HR system have an emotional intelligence score which is updated for each and every employee. So you need to do that because you're trying to prove this hypothesis. And in the same time, as you can see as well, the client feedback will not feature in your HR rights. It's going to feature in the customer service department. So as you can see, Although it's, it's an HR analytics exercise, however, it's collecting data from several aspects, and sometimes it's not uh, the data is not available. You need to go and measure, you need to go and collect, you need to go and sample in order to make sure that whatever you find is applicable as a matter. So this is step number two. Step number four would be utilizing the statistical tests beyond what we do right now, all right? Because what most HR analysts right now do in their job is bar graphs, pie charts, average, means, standard deviation, trends, etc. Now, this is descriptive statistics that's very good, but not enough, because it will not allow us to predict future. It will not allow us to connect the dots. So to connect the dots and to validate hypotheses, we would require a different set of statistical tools or statistical tests that I would like to share with you some of the names only, unfortunately, for the sake of time, we will not be able to take examples here. But I hope you recall from your master's classes or from your 
bachelor's uh, studies in the statistics course if you had a chance to attend one. Things like correlation, like regressions, like uh, chi-square tests, like t-tests, like uh, survival analysis, like uh, ANOVA tests, like uh, internal consistency, factor analysis, all of these tests, because these can come very handy when it comes to extracting findings and informing decision-making in organization in anything related to people practice. So once you have the measure, you collected the data, you have your sample here, then you can apply whatever tests that are uh, that could be utilized, and as I told you, depending on the kind of data. So, for example, if you are doing a logistic regression, one of the variables, which is called dependent variable, should be a binary variable. Or at least a categorical variable. An ordinary variable, sorry. But in correlation, you will have to uh, utilize two continuous variables. As the correlation, the normal one that we all use, or what is technically called the Pearson correlation. So all of these tests, you need to be familiar with. If you read scientific papers, this is what you will read in the methodology of research. If you read reports on uh, composition and benefits, like the uh, salary surveys that, you know, service the market in the beginning of each year or at the end of each year, depending on your provider, then this is what you are going to read. If you utilize psychometric assessments, this is how these tests become validated. So we need to get to know more about those things, those tools, shall I call them. So once you're done with that, then you're done with the technical part. And now you need to move back to the world of the common people who do not understand those terminologies. And you'd like to start with preparing your findings, your conclusions to be communicated to stakeholders. And this will involve visualizing your data, simplifying a little bit some of the terms, like please, you, you will not be able to say the internal consistency of a questionnaire. You just want to say that this questionnaire has a bit of validity because it collects data in a coherent manner, some regular English that everyone understands. Make sure as well that when you communicate the finding to be tactful in a way that um, sometimes you will identify problems while you are analyzing the data. Make sure that when you address the stakeholders, you will address it in a problem-solving mindset, not in a finger-pointing mindset. Make sure as well that you maintain the integrity of the data across from the beginning, from the formulation of the hypothesis all the way toward the communication, because sometimes analysts tend to fall in love with their own hypothesis, and if the data disapproves with the hypothesis itself, they tend to bend the data sometimes, so we need to maintain our integrity. But most importantly, when you communicate the findings, make sure that you aspire humility, make sure that you, whatever you claim is only one step towards the understanding of the full reality of what people, problems you are encountering, what are the trends that you have identified, what is the knowledge that you are offering, and what are the recommendations that you are going to, uh, to suggest for the stakeholders. So this is the part of communicating the findings. And finally, once you want to reach the apex of this exercise, you need to make sure that you are offering practical recommendations. And in order to offer uh, a practical recommendation, any HR analyst needs to fulfill those three areas. First of all, HR practitioner has the ability to come up with a hypothesis. So the more you dive into the modern practices of human resources, the more you will be able to come up with insightful hypotheses. 
In the same time, you need to be business oriented. You need to understand your business. So if you spend all your day in the office, it means you are disconnected from the business. It might uh, make you study the wrong problem altogether. And thirdly, the recommendation needs to be innovative. It needs to be not only innovative, okay, not only innovative, but also innovative in terms of making sure that it will resolve the problem eff efficiently with the right solution and with the considerable amount of resources in order to make sure that we consider that this recommendation is plausible and is going to serve the business itself. So these are the six steps of uh, any HR analytics exercise that one has to uh, undergo. And I would like to wrap up with some findings that uh, I believe that you will find very important. And I'll share them in the order of appearance in the, uh, in the reports and in the news, just to tell you a little bit of the status of HR analytics nowadays in the market. So in 2018, the CIPD found that 29% of HR professionals are confident in using data to make So imagine, 71% of people are. In 2019, Gartner found that 64% of HR leaders, they lack analytical skills to leverage HR. In 2020, LinkedIn found that only 6% of HR professionals utilize the advanced analytical techniques like the one that we have been sharing throughout this uh, uh, webinar. Deloitte said that 82% of organizations believe that people analytics is critical. However, 21% they have people analytics team and 16% have a mature people analytics practice. So you see, the high level of awareness low level of competence. In 2022, Gartner said that 60% of HR leaders have difficulty finding HR professionals with the necessary data. And Sherm said that 70% of professionals believe that's very important for their job to utilize data analytics, while 32% are only, only are confident in utilizing it. And finally, in 2023, LinkedIn reported that the number of job postings for HR professionals with data analytics skills have increased by 37%. What is all this telling us? There's an opportunity for each and every one just there. So I'd like to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, please, just to wrap up. There are lots of resources, free, online, in books, in videos, in tutorials, that would allow you to develop these skills of data analytics, especially in the human resources area. Please do not get behind when it comes to this. And thank you so much for your time. I'd like to allow a few minutes for your question, whether you'd like to type it in through the chat or just open up your mic and share it out loud. I will allow uh, some time for your question, hopefully that I could address all of them as much as I can. The time frame for such detailed events. Well, yes, for sure. Um, the step that will take the most of your time is step number two, which is the collection uh, of the data set. 
And if you're lucky enough, that would be only a cleaning process that will take you a couple of days. However, if you don't have the data, sometimes it might go up to three or four months to collect the data that, uh, that you need. You need sometimes to develop surveys, to test the surveys, to pilot them, to send them and wait for responses, to send reminders, and then to undergo the, uh, the data conversion. So I would say fairly three to four months on average, although it's not based on statistics or on, on research, based on my own experience with that. Having like knowing that some of this some of the research problem could take years, depending on the kind of research question that you have. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, tell your name, but it, since it starts with FA, I'll call you Farah because you bring joy to me with the question that you just. Got. Great. So. Allow me please to uh, wrap up unless someone is uh, preparing a question by telling you that if you would like to be certified in HR analytics, uh, Merck is offering a, a certification endorsed by the IIBA or the International Institute of Business Analytics. It's a five-day course uh, that uh, allows you to get two certifications. One of them is the uh, professional certificate in uh, HR analytics. And in this year, this course is offered three times in Feb, in July, and in November. So please feel free to uh, reach out to us if you would like to know more about it, if you'd like to explore the options of uh, registering yourself. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I wish you a lovely afternoon and uh, stay safe, take care, bye-bye. dot com.